Okay, so this is going to be a little bit different to the usual sort of videos I make, mostly because it's not about video games, which I know. Shock horror, I play regular games as well as the Bing Bing Wahoo electronic variety. This is a very quick video I'm putting together, mostly just because I was just interested in... Is there much interest, you know, to this? You see a lot of people play video games talk about stuff like Kingdom Death Monster or Pathfinder, but... This is one of the ones you don't hear about too much, and I'm going to be talking to you about Malifaux, which is a game I really love by Weird Miniatures. Um, if you can't tell by miniatures, it's a miniatures game, a tabletop uh, skirmish game. They're called for the most part. They're games that, whereas things like Warhammer were, uh, well, Warhammer Fantasy, which is now dead, were large scale miniatures armies where you have hundreds of figures. Skirmish is, you know, a dozen, a handful, a gang, a crew. Uh, that sort of thing. So, they've just announced a third edition for the game, which is a revision of the rules, uh, big changes, big shakeups, and I just wanted to talk about that. But first, since I know this is you know not my usual thing, and maybe something that you don't know about, unless you know you've been searching for Malifaux on YouTube and found this, which I'm sorry if you expected some big tabletop game channel. This isn't it, you know. Hopefully, I'll do some more stuff in the future. But I'm. I'm just testing new equipment and I wanted to blather about something, so here we both are. I'm sorry. So, the best way to start talking about this, I think, is to describe the background to the game, which is basically just the fluff, or the lore, which is the more common uh, video game term for, you know, story around the game. So, where does it start in Malifaux? Essentially, and this is a very brief description, it goes like this. In 1787, on an alternate Earth, magic, like a finite precious metal, was running out. In desperation, a gathering of the world's strongest sorcerers, magicians and witches enacted a spell of planetary proportions. With a shanty town of gathered mages acting like a giant rune on the surface of the world, they used it as fuel to cast a spell to find a source of new magic to break down the barriers between the world and another right for the pillaging. The spell consumed almost all but the most gifted spellcasters using their life force as fuel, but it worked. They opened a breach in reality, a doorway to another world not too dissimilar from Earth, but it was still alien in both clear and subtle ways. At the bottom of the rolling hills the breach spilled out upon, the first explorers found a city. A city with no people. An architecture blending all the cultures of our world together like a layer cake. They found that, with time and persistence, they could translate the native language that was written on every sign and carved into the masonry. Some of it was perfectly understandable. Libraries, blacksmiths, playhouses. Others, such as Death Surgeon or Mechanical Magics, were complete unknowns. One thing was clear, the city had a name, Malifaux. In exploring Malifaux, many a great secret was found, necromancy, automatons, magical prosthesis to replace lost limbs and more. But the crux of all this was a magical resource known as Soulstone. Soulstone was essentially fuel for magic. Not only did it restore the waned abilities of Earth's magical practitioners, but many even swore it granted them far greater power than they ever possessed back on Earth. But Soulstones were rare and eventually ran out of power, power that by accident or experimentation was discovered to only be restored when in near proximity to the death of a human being. For a time, this was a new gold rush, a new boomtown on an interdimensional frontier that promised limitless power and fortune to anyone brave enough to pass through the breach. Like the booming period of the American Wild West, Malifaux brought in scholars, researchers, migrants, political agents and naturally many crooks working behind the scenes to get their piece of the pie. The only issue of course was the question people should have asked but never really did. Where are the people who built Malifaux? It was 1797. After a decade of industrious colonization, they finally got the answer. It was the worst blizzard on record. People froze to death on the streets. Every night was spent desperately huddled together in taverns and brothels for warmth. Eventually, the blizzard grew to such severity the great stone frame built around the breach began to crumble and fall. The breach itself was shrinking, and those that could made a mad dash back to Earthside before it closed completely. Nothing from Earth, however, could pass back through, so great was the force of this supernatural storm. A metric ton of soul stones were burnt out trying to stabilise this solitary link to the lifeblood of Earth's economy and prosperity, but to no avail. Just as the portal was winking out of existence, a single human corpse was tossed through the breach. Cut into its chest was a single word in English. Ours. The way to Malifaux closed, with no way to open it again. The soul stones were now truly finite, and overnight became the source of many global conflicts as nations tried to get a monopoly on the now rationed use and transportation of these precious magical gems. For years, the world was ravaged by war, till in 1814, an organisation known as the Guild 
part Wild West judicial system, part Matthews-style corrupt authoritarian regime, took over as the primary governing body for most of the Western world. Then, in 1897, one century to the day, some say to the minute, the breach once again tore itself wide open. Thousands of guild soldiers were sent through to discover not unlike the real world story of the Mary Celeste, Malfoy was completely empty, absent of all human life, yet still bearing all signs of human habitation, as though the great catastrophe of a hundred years ago happened only minutes before, and all the victims were spirited away without a trace of how or why. Whilst clearly dangerous, the Allura Soulstones was too great to pass up another attempt at colonising a smaller, walled-off portion of the city. The governments of the world finally united with a proposal. The guild would take control of Malifaux, and the world would send its criminals and debtors to pay the debt to society, working as little better than slaves in a second Soulstone rush. This time, however, the natives of Malifaux would be less subtle in their disagreements with this arrangement. They made themselves known violently and regularly. The original denizens of the city were called the Neverborn, like fairy tales and nightmares made flesh, they are literally the monsters under your bed, the creeping shadow coming up the stairs, and worst of all, the doppelganger that replaced your spouse or child, who seems to be acting a little odd recently. But it's probably nothing, right? The bayou outside the city is infested with gremlins, green-skinned hillbilly gangs, each with their own inbred fiefdoms that value pigs and whiskey above all else. The trade routes out of the city remain heavily guarded as any bad day can end with a caravan drag screaming into the muck, by a hollering gang of whiskey addled greenskins riding great war pigs to battle. Though some, like Ophelia Lacroix, show a genius intellect that makes them something far more dangerous than your average gremlin that is far more likely to die to drunken misadventure than upon the swords of any guild watchman. But not all adversaries come from without. The ruins of Malifaux outside the guild's new quarantine zone whisper to the destitute and downtrodden workforce. Books that tell dark necromantic secrets may lead to a normal man disappearing for weeks only to show up with a gang of undead in tow under the now insane sorcerer's thrall. These are the Resurrectionists, and the greatest criminals in the eyes of the guild. Beyond them are the Arcanists, spellcasters that would strike out alone and not live under the yoke of the guild's oppression. Many of them are powerful, and the combination of independence and the skill to rival their own makes them another threat to the guild's dominance. Underneath all these great conflicts of magic and undeath, however, remains a more subtle but equally strong competitor. The Miners, the Steamfitters, the Union, the great rail lines that lead steam trains to thunder from one side of the bridge to the other, belching toxic smoke across the horizon, was built with the literal blood, sweat and tears of many artisans, mechanical geniuses, and an army of labour both from felons and debtors of the West, and from grossly mistreated migrants from China. These magical machinists look out for each other simply because nobody else will. They are looked down upon as grease monkeys, they kept the wheels of commerce and industry well tuned and greased, but never got the recognition deserved for the amount of bodies spent to forge this seamless machine of industry. Though many serve a dual purpose in Malifaux, an organisation from the East known as the Ten Thunders clan has infiltrated Malifaux through the Steamfitters Union. Because to a regular guild watchman, what's one more foreign migrant grease monkey to them? They all look the same and talk funny, right? That's that's not that they're all the same. It doesn't matter. Well, maybe that's because as master spies and assassins, they are playing exactly the role that these xenophobic guards expect them to do. From their own little cultural island known as the Little Kingdom, on the edge of Malifaux, they are the organised crime, the mobsters, the crime lords and agents sent by the Three Kingdoms of China to open smaller breaches in warehouses and the back rooms of brothels, to extort Soulstone right under the guild's noses, and more importantly, bring in more soldiers ready for the day they take Malifaux for themselves. Beyond them are the outcasts, mercenaries, freaks and lone gunslingers for hire willing to kill for any of the aforementioned factions as long as the pay is good enough. It is a ruthless, cruel world breachside, and Malifaux can promise great fortune for all, but for most it's a short life ending in misery and blood. Like the saying goes, in Malifaux, bad things happen. So that's the very basics of the lore. New fluff books have progressed the plot, but the gist of it is a late 19th, early 20th century city in another world. It holds a tenuous point of interest for multiple warring factions and chaotic free agents. The game itself is a skirmish game where you pick a master and, depending on game size, have a soulstone limit to recruit a crew, and you play through scenarios either as a standalone tabletop game or a long narrative campaign that tells a story. Its quirks include cross-faction models as the henchmen you can pick and choose to suit your playstyle with, playing with a deck of poker cards instead of rolling dice known as a fate deck with the ability to cheat right out of a western to cheat fate and influence your draw number and its effects, and a very unique turn and genre blend that allows for some really inventive sculpts for the models. So why do I like it? Well, first off, the theme is like elements of Bloodborne, Deadwood, Mordheim, and Steampunk for a blender, and that's rad. It's weird western meets Lovecraftian horror and sci-fi fantasy. Sure, there's the drunken poker player, he's lost his money, he's leaving the tavern, and he's following a hooker down an alley for a quick rut. But, in this universe, 
Maybe it's a dark night, and through the steam coming up from the gutters, he's too drunk to notice the woman leading him away from prying eyes has been dead for months, and what's waiting around the corner is not a, you know, a quick go and then he's going back home, it's a necromancer with a bag of surgical tools waiting for his bait to reel in another catch. <coughs> or maybe it's a downtrodden workforce. People that have lost entire body parts on the construction of the rail lines, now walking on steam-driven piston-powered legs, or bending steel with crushing pneumatic claws that replaced lost arms. It's everything you know from Wild West action stories or Victorian true crime, but with a sinister, supernatural twist, and that's goddamn radical. On top of that, the fate date mechanic is really neat. If I play Warhammer, there's really only six potential results from rolling a dice that usually only have two or three outcomes at most. In Malifaux, I'm pulling from a shuffled poker deck with a lot of potential for being screwed over or dealing a crushing game-changing blow to my opponent. It's got style and tone locked down like no other tabletop game I've ever played, and I really love it like no other game, you know, outside of the video game variety. So after all that, what is the third edition? Well, it's the third retail iteration of Malifaux. New rules, new models, same world, bad things still happen, but maybe it happens in different ways to different people. Right now, it's just, just been announced, so this is literally all we know so far. Like Age of Sigmar, crews are now hired based on a keyword. If you've got a master from the Arcanist, then you are looking for that same faction keyword on henchmen as well, with a greater cost to hire outside your faction. They say this is to keep faction theming alive, and honestly, most people I play with stuck to this already, so I can only see it having a noticeable effect on dual faction masters. Now they've only got to play as one. They say this is to keep faction theming alive, and honestly, most people I play with stuck to one theme anyway, so this is really only going to have a major effect on the dual type masters that have now been cut down to only one faction. For example, McMorning had his cover in the guild blown and is now full resurrectionist. So according to the new thematic keywords, will former staples of his crews like Brutal Effigy or Francisco be removed as options for him? Probably, which naturally makes you ask which of my current playstyles or strategies are no longer viable in 3rd edition. We're going to have to wait and see, but some shakeups to rosters are going to be inevitable. They claim the core of the game remains the same, but streamlined. More range of movement to quote, get you into the action faster. Perhaps this means shorter games where speed and range make melee more redundant as gunslingers and long range summoning makes up the new meta. Who knows? Then there's an apparent reduction of bloat from over 100 conditions to 11. Less mixing of factions for a crew roster, a reduction of all actions and abilities making memorising a long list less of a focus over pure gameplay. This has already been worrying to some, but not that surprising since this happened going into 2nd edition as well. Seamus' rotten bells were a lot more complex in 1st and people hated using them because of it. In 2nd, they were streamlined and this version became a go-to Zambi generic goon, so maybe that'll become more common now. The cards are going to be redesigned and there will be new models across the board, like the transition to second, which saw some admittedly poor metal sculpts replaced with some fantastic, if a little fiddly to assemble plastic sculpts that in many cases put Games Workshop to shame. Now, this was expected to say nothing of the passage of time and characters dramatically changing from who they were in-game many years ago when the breach opened to who they are now. They say all the old models will still be legal and all cards will be sold in one pack or available in the iOS Bad Things Happen app, and this will ensure a seamless transition of most existing crews to version 3 from the current one. Now this is great as many games like War Machine almost collapsed when they changed editions because sales dried up as people were too scared to put money down on anything when the new version was announced but not yet released because people were worried, will this model be shitty, will it be incompatible, or worst of all, will it be removed from the game entirely? Which brings me to the big thing for people who are currently invested in the game already, altered or removed masters. Quite a few are changing faction. Marcus now works with the Neverborn, the Brewmaster is now Bayou only after leaving the Ten Thunders, and with the changing guild leadership, some of the more corrupt officials have been left to side with the Arcanists or Ten Thunders instead. To say nothing of the models that are now just going away completely. Ramos is in prison in Vienna back on Earth. Lilith, likewise, is locked away from the Breachside Realm in a supernatural prison. Nicodem is dead, cut into fine chunks by Lady Justice, and Collodi, the wandering marionette, he's simply gone with Weird only teasing at a future story to reveal what's happened to him. These masters will still be playable with a new Dead Man's Hand deck mechanic, but unless the tournament allows it, they will no longer be included in legal play, with many assuming they'll just straight up not be supported anymore after this. This reminds me of when Age of Sigmar replaced Warhammer Fantasy in some armies, which they couldn't cover for copyright reasons, like the Tomb Kings were given essentially pity rules and then quickly forgotten. Neverborn players in particular are upset that they are losing a lot more than they are gaining, and losing more than most other factions combined. I'm a Ten Thunders slash Resurrectionist guy myself, so it doesn't bother me personally, but I can really understand the upset and can only assume that the first significant post-launch update will include some heavy Neverborn focus to compensate. 
Although that said, Neverborn have always been tied with the Bayou Gremlins as the overwhelmingly popular choice, and maybe they're just trying to give some other faction some tabletop time instead. The Guild and Ten Funders in particular seem to be either growing or shifting in power in the fluff, and that focus might easily reflect expectations for them on the tabletop in third. On top of all of this, there is an NDA covered closed beta taking applications, and while there will no doubt be a third edition rulebook full of fluff and lore as sold as a hard copy, the cards and the rules are all going to be put online for free. This is a really good move to keep people playing. Nothing kills a game faster than long-time players going, what do you mean I'm no longer allowed to play my guys? And then they leave the game and they never bring anyone new into it as well. This allows existing models to stick around with free rules, allowing for an easier transition from one edition to another. Personally, this seems like they want to cut down on the bloat that was leading to the decline second has seen in the last year or so. While not a direct comparison, I've made a few Age of Sigmar comparisons because it seems like they are getting a lot of their consumer response toolkit from them. You make the game more streamlined and give away the rules, since the rules are only ever bought once but the models are bought forever and make up the most of your income, and it's a model that served Games Workshop very well. Granted, people are still platinum tier but mad about Warhammer Fantasy blowing up, but Age of Sigmar has grown massively in success and making the rules free and trying to keep all the models viable in some fashion surely helped in this regard and it'll definitely help here as well. Now what do I want to see the most? Easily an attempt at rectifying roster bloat. The game is a skirmish title about crews, now a mid-tier war game about militias to a degree. Unfortunately, the last two years saw the game go from, on average, like 6 to 12 models in a game to, in some cases, as high as 30, and I've seen every single person I know drop War Machine and Hordes for this exact reason. A few nameless goons is fine, but the bigger lore of Malifaux, like Mortheim and Frostgrave, is the names and faces you grow to love and their place on your crew. I hope the numbers shrink down and go with a faster, more streamlined design, so it goes back from and you need this box of 4 and this box of 3 and don't forget to pre-order this box of 5 because that's the meta, and go back to oh shit, their Petita Ortega is coming around that shack to the east, I need to respond to that quick. But maybe most love the larger scale and I'm in the minority, I, I, I don't know, but I can only say what I want to see is the biggest change and that's easily number one for me. So, overall, I'm excited. It's not too much information to go on right now, but it's got people talking about the game again in numbers I've not seen in like two years, and new people who've been brought into skirmish games in general by their affordability, small numbers of models to assemble and paint and so on, are deciding that, hey, now it's time to take the plunge. I applied for the beta test, and while it's under NDA and I could not comment on the changes on my channel, if I got in, I hope I'm going to be pleased with the changes when putting them into practice on the tabletop, because right now, Streamlined is something that Malifaux could do with to some degree. For now, I'll end by saying if you never heard of it, wondered what this weird shit is on my Beat Boot video game channel and now you're interested, I highly recommend the two player starter kit. It's 30 to 40 pounds or around 50 bucks or less online. It's got two fate decks, two tape measures, two mini crews of four guild and four neverborn models that you can add to either of those factions crews that are exclusive to the box and look really cool and the basic rules which don't appear to be changing that much and will at least give you a sense of if you like the game or not. After that, check out which masters are coming in 3rd edition or still sticking around, pick the one you like and snap up their box for around £20 or $30 online or at any friendly local traditional game store. It's a really fantastic game that I hope is only going to get better and if you love to mix your Deadwood with your Lovecraft or your Westworld with your Hellraiser, then boy does weird have the game for you. Now, this went a little longer than I expected, but still, it's something different, so if you made it to the end, thank you for watching. I know this is different to the video game stuff I usually do, but it's something I wanted to comment on and just test some new equipment. Maybe you've never heard of it and I piqued your interest, or maybe you're a long time player yourself and you were just searching around to see what other people thought. Maybe you've got your own opinion on the changes and your hopes for the future and I really want to see what they are in the comments, so let me know. Either way, thanks very much for watching. See ya!